Okay. Good afternoon. So um, today we're going to talk about um, multi fidelity learning. Um, so, uh, oh, I, uh, focus right. Um, we already sort of talked a little bit about this in uh, emulation before. So, the notion, if you remember, about why the statistical emulator might be more interesting than just a way of um, uh, like a lookup table to replace the simulator is I think this really interesting idea where you start building statistical emulators that capture the difference between your simulators. So here the idea is we have low fidelity simulations, uh, higher fidelity simulation, and we have the real world. So in like a Formula One example, these might be a couple of different ways of doing computational fluid dynamics with uh, different models of turbulence perhaps. So that might be computer simulation. This simulator could even be a physical real world simulator. It might be the wind tunnel. And then the real world might be um, uh, testing on the track. Um, and you know, you'd have that for any, that we had exactly the same setup, set up with Prime Air where you had the same things going on. Although uh, there was also a big cage where they used to test the drone inside a big warehouse as well. So it wasn't quite real world. So you've got these three different simulations and what you're using is the statistical emulator to try and capture. Um, differences between uh, those simulations and hopefully differences between how they capture what's going on in the real world. And the notion is that you wanna do this sort of idea that is, is there in probabilistic numerics, but probabilistic numerics is um, taking a slightly different approach to this as well, that you're trading off different types of computation to get an answer. So you might, you, sort of, you can imagine an ideal world where your acquisition function is telling you, what do I want to do? Do I want to do a real world experiment? Do I want to do computational fluid dynamics? Do I want to do a wind tunnel experiment? What's the optimal thing to do to get the most amount of information to address the task that I want to do next? Now, that's kind of like the ideal. The reason that's difficult to do in practice is writing down such an acquisition function might be quite hard you know, and getting sufficient flexibility of emulators might be quite hard. There's a number of reasons why we might not get to that ideal, but that's kind of the imagined ideal. The statistical emulators use their, yeah, they, they may not capture uncertainty correctly between these different entities. They use their uncertainty to say, oh, actually what would be most useful now is to do a wind tunnel test or whatever else. Um, so, so how, how do we do that? Well. What we do is what we say is uh, we try and start constructing models that tell us that the high fidelity is a function of the low fidelity. In this case, we multiply that function by a multiplier, so scaled function of the low fidelity, plus some sort of error of the low fidelity. So what we could potentially start by doing, this is a simple sort of idea, that when we look at this plot here, we could say this high fidelity here. So if we want to connect these two here, we say this high fidelity is equal to this low fidelity times some scaling factor plus some error function, which is representing how the low fidelity is, is failing in practice. That makes sense? So that's a sort of linear representation. And then, of course, we can actually go, we can scale that. So we can talk about different levels of fidelity that I've labeled T here rather confusingly because it makes it look like time. But um, here, in this case, T is different levels of fidelity. And what we say is like, as T goes large, we've got the highest level of fidelity. And we sort of keep saying the higher levels of fidelity are related to the lower level of fidelity plus some uh, error associated with them. Okay. So what does that mean in practice? Well, if we have a design matrix where we've got inputs for the low fidelity and the high fidelity simulations, what this tells us is that the covariance function by standard Gaussian rules between observations around the low fidelity and the high fidelity, so X is our sort of uh, our inputs are gonna be 
generated of this form. If we're assuming that um, zero mean for the Gaussian process, as we often do, you could put means in, but we're not assuming means here. What it tells us is that the joint covariance between the low fidelity and the high fidelity is just equal to this sort of block form where this is the covariance for the low fidelity. So if I sort of like, I can't reach up there, but the board's lower, I, I, would, shield, I would shield this column and this row. And then that gives me the marginal distribution over F low, which is just covariance K low. Should be J low, shouldn't it? Um, so here down in this lower diagonal, we've got K low plus K er, I don't know. Um, so down in this, is, which is just the covariance, but we've got it sort of what's going on here is if you remember what we've defined is that the high fidelity is rho times the low fidelity plus the error. So that means that the covariance of that portion is rho squared times the low fidelity, right? Because it's a covariance, so that's squared, plus the covariance coming from the error term. And then you can also work out the cross covariance terms and they turn out to be rho times K log, yeah? So this gives you the correlation between the high fidelity and the low fidelity. What has this given us now? We've got this. What does this give us the ability to do? I know yeah. Yeah, so conceptually, that's absolutely right. So conceptually, you can think about, imagine augmenting this design matrix with a binary indicator, high or low, right? So you've got an additional thing, zero for high, one for low, going up to T for the higher levels or whatever, yeah? And now you've got just, you kern this thing, which is a multi-output function with low and high into one Gaussian process, where one of your inputs tells the Gaussian process which function to do on the output. So somehow now we've actually got a slot in replacement for the sort of methodologies we use because we can just put this one Gaussian process into the system. But now we're not just looking over the design points on the input. One of the new criteria we look over is do we want a low or high fidelity measurement? Now, that lower high fidelity measurement is typically going to be associated with a lower or higher cost. Why would you ever do a lower fidelity measurement? Well, because it's cheaper, because it's faster to run, something like that, right? So you would need to start including that in the acquisition function. But basically, the formalism we've given so far, we've now got a single Gaussian process that we can just substitute into that formalism. Um, so that's exactly what you see here. Um, what I'm trying to sort of show you is this sort of new setup where you've got um, in, in MUKIT, what you have is an indicator that says if it's low or high. That's exactly how we do multiple uh, output Gaussian processes in GPI as well. That what you end up with is putting the two functions in the same joint covariance because the functions are correlated with each other. And then you have an indicator which function you're interested in. And this allows you to ask questions about the posterior updated cross covariance between the two functions, right? So you can, given your low fidelity predictions, like you can start saying, or oh, what would I expect my high fidelity prediction to say? Um, and if you hadn't had any high fidelity predictions yet, you would just see same as low fidelity plus that error being added on. If you'd had some high fidelity predictions, that error term, you would start to get an understanding of what that error term was likely to be. So, um, Here's the sort of uh, function, this is the Forrester function. And the idea here is we've got two sort of variants of it. One is the low fidelity and one is the high fidelity and they're related. So the, the low fidelity is capturing some parts of the Forrester function. And that's the idea again, you have to imagine that one of the, that this is cheap to compute because obviously why would you ever work on this yellow when you've got something which is much more accurate? So you have to imagine for some reason, yellow is cheap to compute. You're not having to take the car to the racetrack to compute yellow you just have to press a button on a computer. Um, and what we can do is we can sort of um, jointly try and estimate where we think the high and low fidelity is by going through, I think, uh, I don't exactly recall, I suspect this is just predicting the um, form of the high fidelity function using integrated variance reduction. You can check it in the code. 
Um, and what we see is that you can start getting an idea of this form here without sampling the high fidelity pieces here because the low fidelity function is capturing some shape of that. And that's being captured in our predictions for what's going on here, right? So the notion there is that you can do, so here you can see mostly we've got samples from the low fidelity and we've got a really quite a confident idea of what the low fidelity function looks like, but we're also gaining quite a good idea of what the high fidelity function should look like because the low fidelity and the high fidelity are correlated under that model. Now what, that looks nice, doesn't it? Um, if we, uh, oh yeah, here's the comparison to the standard GP. If we, if we weren't to use the low fidelity, in that case, if you were to just look at the points we sampled with the high fidelity, then this is what the standard GP um, uh, would do. The linear multi-fidelity GP is the blue and the standard high fidelity GP, so just looking at those points only, doesn't capture this fact that this is likely to be going up, it sort of goes down there. So it just misses that feature. Okay, so that's nice. Um, but yeah, well, what's, what, what might be wrong with that? Gives it away on that slide. What might, what might be problematic about that? Why might that not work in practice? Something that we are maybe wrong for the, for the full function. So if we, if we have something in some part of the function, well, probably the features of the error that, that we capture at that part may, may not be applicable to the whole function. Yeah, so we're trying to characterize the error with a single function and it's additive. Um, so it's an additive function to that. In practice, we might have a situation where that's not quite true. So yeah, we, we're trying to, so if we don't capture that error correctly, then we basically end up with a situation where, well, well, we'll end up with a situation we'll see in the next slide. So this is an example from Andreas Damianu, who um, uh, was one of the people in the team who was working on this. So yeah, so we did, we use this for um, this type of technology for the primary drones work. So here we've got um, uh, the low fidelity is, right, so in some sense, the high fidelity, think of the high fidelity as being this whole function that it's that times the square of sine eight pi x, right? Um, and then we've got a low fidelity version of that that is just sine eight pi x, right? So this is clearly non-linearly related. So in this case, the question is how, is there something you can do here, right? Because like we're actually not seeing the low fidelity thing at all. We're seeing some squared version of it. So in this case, what we've got here is like, you can see the low fidelity in this case, which is just that um, sine eight pi X. And then the high fidelity X minus square root of two of that sine squared. So you, you see there is some sort of relationship, right? Because you're getting, there's some sort of periodic thing here. There's potentially information in these, but it's quite misleading at these points because it's not got the, um, uh, minus sine squared component, yeah. Now, um, if you just look at the correlation between the high fidelity and the low fidelity, you see something like this, which is unsurprisingly not very good. So you're seeing some like the quadratic shape in there. So basically the, the low fidelity to the high fidelity, I think if you were to compute a correlation coefficient, it would say zero because it, if it's symmetric about that, I'm guessing it's symmetric about that, because I think that's the point here. Correlation would say there's no correlation between the low fidelity and the high fidelity. But in fact, there's a lot of structure between the low fidelity and the high fidelity. So there should be some sort of information. Like if, if we do know the low fidelity, um, then it should tell us something about what the high fidelity is. Or that if we, and if we look at it this way, if you say the high fidelity is 0.75, you kind of know that the low fidelity is one of four values is another way of seeing that. So if you try the linear multi-fidelity model, this is what you get because it can't handle the fact, can't handle the fact, can't handle the truth. Um, the, uh, you know, so what it's trying to do is it's actually sort of doing some sort of aliasing fit because it wants to um, fit the sine squared and it thinks that's linearly related to the output. So obviously, by the way, if you had only high fidelity output points, it would fit, but then there's no point in the low fidelity. And of course, in practice, it's gonna to want to sample the low fidelity um, because it thinks that that's a cheaper thing to do. So in this case, it, it sort of, it doesn't work. 
So the other sort of thing in the multi-fidelity thing is to actually to do a nonlinear multi-fidelity model. So in this case, instead of having a row as a factor times, what we're saying here is row as a function. So what you're saying is that the high fidelity is a composition of two functions. One is row and one is F low, right? So F low now goes through a nonlinear function instead of just being multiplied. And we can add in some sort of noise term here. In fact, I think in, by delta, that implies that that's just white noise. It, if we wanted it to be, it could be a, a, a full covariance error function, but delta is implying it's white noise. And so this row here is a function of that function here. So any ideas on, on what we could make that function? What do we like to make here? Go ahead. It could be a Gaussian process. <laughs> and it could be anything. So it's great. Like um, it's in general, we could make it anything. So we could just make it the square or we could make it, but that's a parametric form. And, and if you look at this example here, the, this made up example, this function has, it has this form, this quite odd form here, right? So um, the question is, if you don't know that function, how are you going to estimate it? And you could do a number of things. You could make it a neural network, you know, just don't tell me you did it. <laughs> oh, you can, it's fine to make it a neural network. Jonathan. But so include this form that like, we can't make the function in the form of the software be like this because here it can go from F low and it. Yeah, it's interesting actually. Um, yeah, yeah, no, that would be true. Yeah, so this one also is a mismatch. So we'll see if it works because there's a mismatch here, right? Um, so yeah, one idea is that we could make this a Gaussian process. And so you won't be surprised to hear, um, well, Andreas, who did this example, he led on the paper where we did that, because this, this form, by the way, which is, this is a composition of functions. Um, what do people call composition of functions in machine learning? Well, there's a question. What do we call composition of functions in machine learning? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. What's it called? Function composition in machine learning. <laughs> well, it's in, yeah, it's used a lot in neural networks, but what particular term do they use? Stacking layers, yeah, but what do they call that? Yeah, convolution is one thing you can do with it, but what's the general name for the field? Deep learning, yeah. <laughs> and you wonder why machine learning is the more hyped of machine learning and mathematics, yeah. If you call composition of functions deep learning, then you can sell your company for 300 million. If you just call it composition of functions, People are like, oh, great. That's a sensible thing to do. <laughs> so function composition is basically deep learning. Yeah, question. Um, so it's a good question. Um, I think probably I'm using it, uh, I'm using it as a function here, but the fact I've used Delta, I can't, I'm trying to reconstruct myself from when I wrote this slide. Um, or probably reconstruct uh, construct what Andreas was thinking, because he probably wrote this uh, text, actually. So I suspect what's going on here is it's just a function, um, but by using delta, we're hinting that the covariance function might be a um, Kronecker delta function, and the Kronecker delta function as a covariance gives you white noise. So that's kind of how I would read it, but I appreciate that's not very clear. Um, it's as confusing as calling function composition deep learning. And then, uh, yeah, so this is sort of deep learning. And in some sense, um, so a long time ago, I got quite interested in models like this. Uh, and I called them hierarchical Gaussian process latent variable models, which somehow didn't catch on. Um, and so when we revisited that paper with Andreas uh, for his PhD thesis, um, as part of revisiting that paper, we just called them deep Gaussian processes. And uh, <laughs> so, so there you go. So that's what we'd call a deep Gaussian process. 
but, but to be honest, you see all my old statistics talks, whenever I'm talking about it in statistics talk, I call it um, stochastic process composition, which uh, is what it is, stochastic process composition. Um, but now statisticians have started saying deep learning as well. So I, I'm just giving up. Um, and it is a good idea, composition of functions, because what it gives you is, so it actually, you know, I'm really, uh, for a long time, I wanted to build these composition of Gaussian process models because they have lots of interesting consequences and they're much easier to analyze mathematically than neural networks, but they're harder algorithmic to do, algorithmically to do. But and yeah, and it does work in this case. So in this example, Andreas came up with, um, you've got the low fidelity function, the high fidelity, and what you're seeing here is the predicted low fidelity and the predicted high fidelity coming from the Gaussian process. So it seems, despite the fact it's not quite there, it is able to capture it. I'm not quite sure I could go through. Maybe it's, is, is it not quite capturing some aspects at the bottom? I don't know. That's quite interesting. If you don't, you may not be able to extrapolate quite well. The other thing that might be a consequence of that is it's quite confident. It's sort of building on Yolatin's point because I haven't thought too much about this before. I don't, I can't quite make out error bars down at these points here. So it seems like overly confident around these uh, minimas and it's off the minimum. Maybe there's an error bar there. I can't quite see it, but I'm just trying to see signs. There is a good error bar actually on this one. It's quite hard to make out, but there's an error bar there. It's probably easier to see when the image is. So what's going on, as you'll know, in my images, you're seeing an inverted image. So it works on a black background, but on the notes, you'll see the original non-inverted image. And I suspect then you're going to get a yellow error bar, which might be easier to see. So it does look like there's error bars there and there. But in these cases, it looks like the error bars aren't quite right. Anyway, it does a much better job than the linear case. And then this is its estimate of the relationship between the two. So it's learned some sort of relationship uh, between the two. Yeah. It isn't quite right. Um, and it looks like it's quite confident. So that, that may be the problem Jonathan was pointing out. So I like, I don't know why I have this. So this is a photo of Andreas, um, who's now at Spotify. I have these like circle things, but then I have certain, I, the circle things, yeah, you just, because uh, Andreas and Carl Hendrick work together a lot. And so uh, I do the same to you. Uh, peeking out of a little circle. Um, <laughs> I'm not gonna repeat that on the camera. Uh, so, he is really. Um, <laughs> Um, deep Gaussian processes. So stochastic process composition. So this is a sort of methodology that um, um, goes back to this hierarchical Gaussian processes, but Andreas did it in his thesis, oh, I guess some years ago now, I think we published on this 2013. And to me, actually, this was a real, um, I'd wanted to do this for ages because I really like it because there's a certain thing, a mathematician might look at that and say, well, that's just a function. What's the point in that, right? What's the point in process composition? But the point is, and this is what's going on in deep neural networks as well, is that you can start with simpler functions and by composing them together, you can get much more complex functions. So you start with these individual components and then you compose them together and you get more complex functions, which you're able to introduce more information into. Mm -hmm. Now that's what happens in neural networks. In Gaussian processes, I think the most interesting thing that happens is the way the uncertainty propagates through that. Because in neural networks, this is all trivial because of something called the chain rule. And nowadays, the fact, you know, it was even trivial. So my PhD thesis doing neural networks and stuff, we had to spend a lot of time applying the chain rule and differentiating. And, you know, nowadays, you just do automatic differentiation to get the gradients of all those sort of things. Cheating, you know. <laughs> Get computer to do it for you. No such thing for the uncertainties. There's no way of automatically dealing with the uncertainties that should be in these stochastic processes. So this this process here will typically, because it's like the low fidelity process, it will have some certainty and some uncertainty associated with it. And then that uncertainty, if you're looking at why and you want to know your uncertainty of why, the uncertainty in this first process is going to propagate through the second process. 
and that makes it non-Gaussian when it emerges from the second process. So at this level, because this is a Gaussian process, that uncertainty will always be Gaussian, but at this next level, it won't be Gaussian anymore, it'll be non-Gaussian, the uncertainty. And that non-Gaussianity is quite hard to track because it's like a Gaussian function, it's like a Gaussian distribution going through a non-linear function, unless these were all linear. If these were all linear, then you just retain Gaussianity. But yeah, go ahead. Go no, go ahead, no, it's good. I was rambling. Uh, does this mean that you also have interpretability with this? In general? Yes. Yeah, you can do. I mean, I think, I think you, you mean as you construct these models. Yeah, I mean, so the, the idea is that you can build up some old tubes for it and every layer and just to get better and better and better. And the same way, I mean, that's how the neural network architecture works. The nice thing you're saying is I have this uncertainty propagation. Well, if I also have uncertainty, do I also have explainability? And yes and no. I think you can do. You still have to be quite careful about how you construct them. Um, I think whenever you start building complex nonlinear functions, interpretability is a challenge. Um, I think the interesting thing about the way we, we would use this, so th this is in general for a deep Gaussian process. Um, the interesting thing about the way we would use this for um, emulation is I think that interpretability is more likely to emerge because you're going to have observations for F1 itself as well as observations for the composition of F1. So like imagine, so this is the whole function, but what we would actually do is we would probably have F1 as our low fidelity function. Maybe F2 would be fidelity number two, the output of this layer. And the output of this layer could be a higher fidelity and the output of this layer could be an even higher fidelity. That would be one way of setting up. And if you set it up like that, then there's a lot of interpretability in the intermediate layers because they're telling you what the lower fidelity systems are doing. But then that in itself, because you can just use deep gassing processes for emulation full stop. You don't have to do multi-fidelity emulation. And indeed people have done that for like Bayesian optimization or whatever. And in that case, then there's no necessarily feeling, well, you can look at them, but they're hard to interpret. So I'll hand it as a comment. I think you get it also in both the delay of our but the uncertainty is often hard to interpret because at the, at the right at the end, where you're effectively measuring it, it can come from any direction. So if you think about today's you know, identity policies or refinement policies, the only thing the identity is going to do is move the fine function in my city. And the fine function being uncertain is going to be my past. But at any point, it's really hard to backtrack where they did not certainly come from. That's through the lane, which is not. So I'm just seeing what I've got in here. Yeah, I've got some sort of. So maybe let's. Um, your question there. Yeah, sorry, this is towards the clarification question. Um, the low fidelity and high fidelity process. Are those um, simulators or solid Um Yeah, so you have to be careful with. So there's the, um, I can't remember how we call it, in MUKIT, we call it the user function, would be the simulator. And these things are all emulators, but there's multiple user functions now which have different fidelities as simulators. Yeah, does that make sense? Yeah, but ultimately we're treating them as simulators. We're taking a Gaussian process to to jointly model all the simulators. Yeah. So going back, yeah, that's totally right. So coming back to what we're trying to do, if we look at the original picture. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So each of these is now a deep Gaussian process that is um, with its tentacles infecting the world. Um, so one of the fidelities is the real world. Yeah, that's perhaps the like maybe the last layer F. The output of F3, so Y is the real world. The output at F2 might be the simulator, and the output at F1 might be low fidelity and, simulator. And the reason why we would have um, two solid models, uh, one being subsets of, of different fidelities, is because it's just too complicated to model everything. Yeah, I think, yeah, so the reason I put two surrogate models here is to highlight, to try and, yeah, thank you for, because it reminded me how clever it was of me to put multiple emulators on. Because what I'm trying to hint at is don't ever believe you've got one emulator to rule them all, okay. right? So the notion here is that this is maybe the emulator that's answering the question, um, how will the top speed of the car be affected? I mean, I'm making this up. This isn't a question people ask in Formula One, but um, this might be an emulator that answers the question, um, 
what's the sort of um, uh, exit speed of the car at a low speed corner on a given track, right? And it's just way too much. I mean, if you think about, well, it's not, maybe it's not totally too much because you think of the complexity of what's going on in the air around us. And we can just summarize it with temperature, pressure and volume, right? Sufficient statistics. So that's like the simplest form of emulation despite all the movement of air for assuming the air is well mixed. So what the emulators are normally trying to capture is that in the underlying simulator, there's some emergent property that is typically coming from laws of a large number type of effects where you can approximate that system. But I think it's way too much to expect that you'll get one emulator to rule them all. I don't know, maybe. Well, not without doing like DALI type scale, massive things that I don't understand um, or don't have an intuition for. That's what I mean when I say I don't understand something. I mean, I don't have an intuition for it it's, and, and what it might do. Um, yeah, so good questions. So mathematically, I think of this as a composite multivariate function where we put the Gaussian processes over each function. And the key point to remember is that these are vectors at each level. So that's what I mean about multivariate function. So at each layer, it's not the output of what it could be. It could be the output of one function going into a new function. But in general, these are vector functions. So there's a vector coming out of F1, going into F2, going into F3, going into F4. And then the end thing could be a vector function, although often, we're just predicting one thing, like what's the lap time of the car or something like that, yeah? Now, the other way to sort of see this, which is something that if you look at probabilistic stuff, and I think it's, it's just very natural, is that, oh, this is actually just a Markov chain, right? So when you see it probabilistically, all you're doing is your each Gaussian process, you've got the, on, the, on this right-hand side, just off the screen, P of F1 given X is a Gaussian process. And then to get the sort of distribution over Y, sorry, there should be an integral over all the Fs in here. Um, should be integrate over all the Fs. Um, and then you get, you just get the product rule to get the joint distribution over all the Fs. And then we should be integrating to get the thing. There's a question. Make sense? Each F given F, F2 given F1 is like is the Gaussian process, yeah. Right. So, so I can't introduce knowledge about the world with my function that needs to work out. Aha, 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 there we go. <laughs> yes, why not? Yes, when you start realizing what you can do, you could just build any graphical model you like and the techniques that Andreas developed in his thesis, you can use them, right? So back in the old days, we were giving these lectures 15 years ago, we would talk a lot about graphical models. Who's seen graphical models? Probabilistic graphical models, I should say. Yeah, some, a few little bits. So probabilistic graphical models are ways of expressing probability distributions where you use this graph notation and this graph notation just means that this thing here is probability of F1 given X. This thing here is probability of F2 given F1. And the reason this has got circle around it is because we're gonna integrate it out. And the reason this is shaded, not black, is because we're going to observe it. And the reason this is just a dot is because it's a given input to the system, right? We're not going to integrate it out. So it's just a way of representing that. Um, and conceptually for me, when working on these things in the first place, this was always at the heart of what I really wanted to do and build larger in, interactive. And we, I don't think and no one's really done that. I mean, it's, to an extent, Carl Henrik and... Andreas were looking at it together at one point, that sort of thing, but um, it hasn't really been done. And I think the reason this could be interesting is you could do structural learning on this type of thing. And then I think there's some interpretability there because the structural learning would teach you about conditional independences in the system. Yeah? Yeah, so I just want to ask you, so is this um, saying that there's five fidelity uh, in the yeah, actually, this one's just saying that there's two fidelities, one here and one here that we're observing. But it's saying the relationship between this fidelity and this one has a load of stuff going in. But we could hang off multiple fidelities at all points. You could sort of do anything, really. I mean, and, and the point that Jonathan was making earlier about, OK, it doesn't quite fit the Gaussian process structure. You could also build structures that were fitting better to the thing we talked about before. So you've got a very general framework. But quite slow to do inference on. Sorry, when I say inference, I don't mean prediction like they do with neural networks. I mean 
the process of dealing with all these marginal variables, right? So, which is what inference used to mean. I don't know how that changed, but it did. Um, and I'm not sure what we call the old word for inference now, statistical inference, do we say? Maybe just people don't do it anymore. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, integrating out all the Fs, because that's the challenge here. That's why this is hard. It's not analytic to do that. That's the work that Andreas did during his PhD thesis. Okay, so this is sort of in um, GPI. You've already seen GPI. You've already seen this data. So I like to do this data because it's got this outlier. Can I go through this data yet? Yeah, I go through this data so much, I never remember. Have we done this data? Okay, this is the Olympic marathon data. So this is data set. So um, I like Rogers and Geronimi's book, uh, First Course in Machine Learning, and they have these data sets on sprint, the winning sprinting time from the Olympics. Um, but I was giving this course in um, Uganda, and uh, I was giving it in 2012, and Stephen Kipritich had just won, sorry for the Kenyans, had just won the marathon. Um, and he was the first sort of non-Kenyan winner in ages, and only the second ever Ugandan gold medal winner at the Olympics. So it seemed a more interesting data set um, to give, which is showing the, one of the points is, is this guy, Stephen Kipritich, which is there, right? So we've had our marathon since then. But that's Stephen Kipritich winning the London Marathon. Um, now, what I also like about it is it's got this outline here. So it's the marathon times over time are improving, but the sort of things happen because there's the First World War and the Second World War. But this one here, so like Carl Hendrick and I have both run marathons, and I think we're probably up here somewhere like this. I don't know. What's your pace on the marathon? I think my fastest was three hours 47. So you have to divide that by 42. Well, what's your fastest? <laughs> yeah, so even our half marathon, so what's it, 134? Are you going faster than 134? No, no. All right, he's never been faster than 134 in a half marathon. Yeah. But if, if you work out 134 divided by 21, someone do it out in the background if you've got time. You see those times that's like, okay, so that's that's probably about here, right? So four and a half minutes per kilometer. Does anyone here run distance? Yeah, there we go. At what? Yeah. You're half to 133, nice. But you are a lot younger. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, so the half marathons uh, times that we're talking about are probably around here. Um, what's so interesting is, so, so what's your five, 5K time? 1830, that's fast. So it's 5K time, 1830. So he's coming on three, three minutes something. Oh, There's high three minutes, right? So he's running 5K in about this time, right? So when you look at how real marathon runners are running, the marathon like there was this one of these stupid films where in the film they caught up with the front runners no you would not catch up with the front runners the fastest runners in a marathon um so the sheffield had a park run i don't know if you've seen these park runs the 5k park run and the winners of that park run might be finishing in about 16 or 17 minutes these people here are, are running about three minutes per kilometer so they would beat the fastest people in sheffield at the park run consistently across 42 kilometers. They are that fast. They're going really, really fast. Does anyone know how fast Alan Turing could run a marathon? And bear in mind, I did 347. You had 336. How fast was Alan Turing? Anyone want to guess? Two hours, 47. He was 10th in the British Championships in 1946. That's good. <laughs> and, and that was here, right? So he's, he's somewhere around here. So he would have won with that time. He would have won the Olympic marathon back here. Anyway, so we can ask the question, if there had been an Olympic marathon in 1946, when Turing won, came 10th in the British Championship, 2 hours 46. Did I say 2.47? 2 hours 46. He was an hour faster over a marathon than me. And, and the winners nowadays are about 43, 44 minutes faster than Turing was, right? So the difference between me and Turing is larger than the difference between Turing and the winners nowadays. 
Um, so you might want to make a prediction. So here it is. That's Alan Turing running. I kind of think I look cooler when I run, but, um, <laughs> but I never see myself, so I probably don't. Um, so this is, uh, you can just see him listed here, Dr. A. M. Turing, Walton FC, two hours, 46, three seconds. So I got it slightly wrong. Extraordinary, 1946, that's the UK championships and he's 10th. Um, now, so the question is like, if there had been an Olympics in 1946, what's the probability that Alan Turing would have won it? Because this is giving us the winning time. And what do you think of this model? Is this a good model of the Olympic running time? No, it's not at all. Because the problem here is this one's interesting because this is the one that Carl Henrik and I might have had a fighting chance of winning if we really trained. And um, so you might wonder what happened. But I think this is in St. Louis in the States. And they just invented the motor car. So they decided to lead the runners out with motor cars. They hadn't yet invented widespread tarmac roads. So the motor cars kicked up a lot of dust and the runners were choking on the dust and they got lost. Oh. And only six people finished the marathon. <laughs> so we probably wouldn't have had a chance of winning it. <laughs> But yeah, that's why it's an outlier. And the outlier is driving up the variance of the overall process. There's also other interesting things going on. So what I want to show is what happens, can a deep calcium process help? Because we can sort of visualize. So one GP feeding into another. And this is what you get with a deep calcium process. I, I still think that there's problems with this fit, but the fit's a lot better. So what you're seeing here is that the model has decided that variance was higher in this period because it's trying to capture that. It also actually has, um, it can represent this with a non-Gaussian distribution. I think it is doing that to some extent here. Um, and then it's saying that it thinks the variance goes up. It's still like perhaps not as tight as you might expect it here. But one thing it's got is heteroscedastic noise. And it's got heteroscedastic noise because the Gaussian noise in the first layer is being pushed through a non-linearity in the next layer. And to sort of visualize that, I'm going to show you what the two... So there's only two layers in this Gaussian. Oh, there, here's samples from it as well. So one of the things you see for the samples, they're also, they're not very Gaussian actually. So they tend to be quite heavy, a little bit heavy tailed or they're a bit heavier tailed than Gaussians, these samples. So because this is a non-Gaussian system. So showing you the mean and variance is no longer really representative. So I'm showing you some samples uh, dropped through the system. It's, um, yeah, it's an estimate of the 95% confidence interval, yeah. Why is it non-Gaussian? Because if I put a Gaussian through, an, uh, through a non-linearity, that makes it non-Gaussian. But um, the approximation we use projects it back to being Gaussian. So the thing you're visualizing is, is Gaussian error bars, but that's why I'm sampling as well. So dropping balls through the system and sampling stochastically to sort of try and capture the non-Gaussianity. It's not super non-Gaussian, this example. There's other examples in some of my notes where it's much more than a Gaussian. Now, this is what the first layer does. So it doesn't seem to do very much. So the first layer is basically mapping from year to some latent variable. And that latent variable is increasing. But notice one of the things the first layer does is it flattens off in this period here. And that turns out to be quite important in the next layer. Um, and then the other thing that the first layer does is it has some variance associated with it. Now, the second layer looks broadly like the overall function. But remember, coming into this function now is a bit more noise is being injected. So the input here from this thing is with variance. So when this input goes in here with variance, so actually it is going to be broadly Gaussian in this region because it's linear here. It's going to be non-Gaussian in this region here because there's non-linearities going on. But this Gaussian comes in here and comes out as Small variation here becomes a bigger variation on the way out. Small variation here, it's all mapping to the same place. So that's how it's getting the tight error bars. So that's the second layer. And it's the combination of those two that give you that function. So what's interesting about that, and most of what's going on there is not in the, um, is not in the, the functions aren't very complex, they're very simple. It's, it's using the way the uncertainty is going through. So this isn't a multi-fidelity example. This is just a deep Gaussian process in practice. I invented this idea of, um, so I, um, I like to try and, try and dissuade people from the idea that these models are very, very complicated. So one of the analogies I use is I say deep learning systems are like pinball machines. 
So like with balls dropping down, where each layer is a, another set of functions. If that were the case, then they're one dimensional functions to each layer, right? Because there's a set of pins, one dimensional input, one dimensional output. And so I extend that analogy by showing you what the pinball machine looks like in this case, what's happening to the ball as you drop it in from various points. So I've tried to visualize the uncertainty of ball dropped in here, we'll end up in any of this region here, and then we'll map down to any of these regions here, right? And so that's how you're getting an input from 1900 and an output distributed across these regions here. Similarly, if you drop this ball in here, then what actually happens is everything gets projected to roughly the same point. So it doesn't matter whether you're going from 1980 all the way up to about 2010, everything's being projected to about the same point before it's being mapped out, which is giving us the sort of modern marathon pace. That's why it's leveling off, yeah? So that's how it's achieving that with these sort of two layers of functions. You can't do that with a single Gaussian process. Okay, so one of the things we think about, I, well, I often think about, and this is way too coarse, but you can imagine, um, you can imagine doing such emulators to combine different parts of a climate model. So you, you end up with an emulator that's covering human activities. You start bringing that with the ocean model. You stitch all these things together, bring all the uncertainty together, and make some predictive output from the, the series of emulators. So. That would be the notion here. You emulate each of those things. And if you need to compose them together, you stitch them together to, um, to get an overall emulation of your system. And that's the sort of notion. Um, I call that deep emulation. And it's kind of, now that you've got these deep Gaussian process things and you've got that flexibility we talked about, you could do an enormous amount with them in this space. I mean, we, people are doing various bits. The extent to which I'm proposing you can do it is not being done in practice yet. Um, but I, it's, it's an interest of mine to do so. Okay. So, brief reflection. So we're going to sort of do a projects one, one projects talk on Thursday, like about to set you off on your projects. But just before we finish today, um, what we've been giving you is a toolkit of surrogate modeling, modeling, modeling. Um, and your project is your opportunity to use your imagination. So you can combine different parts of that toolkit together. So the sort of thing that you can do, if you choose a simulation you're interested in, could be one we've talked about in the case studies or are going to talk about in the case studies, could be one that you're interested in for personal reasons. You can start combining different aspects together like um, experimental design, Bayesian optimization, multi-fidelity. And what we'll be looking for in the project is you to string a few of those things together to do an analysis of a system, but building that analysis around a narrative about why you think that's interesting. Sensitivity analysis would be another one, right? Um, so next time we're gonna do a um, uh, sort of overview of the projects and what's coming up. Have you seen already, um, oh, that's, what you should see if for those who haven't looked ahead is, that we put up some examples of old case studies here. Um, one of the things we'll do, this case study here, me, Scott, which is one of my favorites, um, we don't have permission to publicly share the video. So one of the sessions we'll do in the coming weeks is just replaying um, Jordan's video about um, simulation and supply chain. But there's other case studies around um, the climate ones are very interesting. Um, this test trace isolate, in particular from a couple of years ago, um, was particularly pertinent at the time, a simulator that one of my team built in collaboration with people in Oxford for the COVID pandemic. Um, so various talks that you, you can have a sort of poke around for inspiration. Scott Hoskins has just so many inspirational examples. He's given two talks. I, was, I think it'd be embarrassing to ask him again, since he's probably covered a lot of the things in these two, but it's such an interesting set of challenges in climate for this area. Um, so there's some inspiration there. And when we're also going to do, um, so we'll have from um, my, two of my PhD students, Sam is going to do a case study in um, machine learning algorithm optimization. And Pierre is going to do a case study inspired by the ice sheet modeling he's going to do. He's going to show you other stuff. That's good. We'll finish now. So let these people in. Um, but thanks very much. And we'll see you on Thursday to talk more about the projects. Okay.